You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jamie Brenner. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. She's got a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. She has a full slate of services that now include beta reading. She's got four beta readers now. So if you're looking for beta reading services, she can definitely take on your project. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors can also inquire about putting their books in her Book Lovers Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. It's free to authors for a limited time. Be sure to check out Crystal and her whole team at Pico's House. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Thanks, Crystal, for sponsoring the show. While Cape and Spandex movies are breaking box office records, comic book commentator and influencer Ed Gosney doesn't want us to forget the roots of these marvelous wonders. His blog, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com, covers the gamut of four-color entertainment from contemporary comic books to comics made for kids to bargain bin gold to classics that will transport you back in time. Comic books are a perfect blend of art and story, and Cool Comics captures the essence of what these funny books mean to us in a personal way. And make sure to join the Cool Comics in My Collection Facebook group where members can interact, show off their prized comics, and have opportunities to win, you guessed it, Cool Comics. Published weekly, Cool Comics in My Collection aims to bring you a smile and reminds us why comic books are fun. Be sure to visit edgosney.com today. Speaking of superheroes and comics, my friend Patricia Gillum has a fantastic series called The Heroes of Corvus. It begins with book one. A flight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. This is such a phenomenal story. Uh, She has released up to part four now, and I cannot wait for part five to come out. If you're looking for a great adventure read that's uh, on the cutting edge of what is in today's entertainment, The Heroes of Corvus is the series for you by Patricia Gillum. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. We're on just about every platform you can imagine. Now stay tuned for our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jamie Brenner on the show with me. She has a fantastic new book called Drawing Home, and uh, this is an exceptional summer beach read if you're looking for something to uh, to drop in your bag and, and take with you and help you to to get lost in the midst of your vacation. This is This is the book for you. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Hank, thank you so much. Happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's a good one. My first memory of wanting to be a writer was sitting in my living room reading Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy (laughs) Bloom. I love it. I love <laughs> Which it. is probably, I, I'm sure I share that memory with millions of oh, yeah. women. But well, and men too. It. Yes, yes. True. Yeah. I, uh, I had an, an older sister um, who's about a year and a half older than me, and everything she got was passed down to me. And so, yeah, I was a huge Judy Bloom fan as well. And maybe that's not popular to say, but I say it. I don't care who, who knows. 
No, she did. No, she actually was very inclusive of having boys' point of view and recognized that boys were going through things as well, and that adolescence wasn't just female territory. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. Um, were you a? You were obviously a, a big reader. What What was it about uh, Judy Bloom that that kind of sparked that in you? Well, I think you know, growing up in the seventies, there was this veneer that everything is like certain things weren't spoken about. It was the seventies, but I think in many, you know, suburban households, it might as well have been the 1950s. And she was the first voice I encountered that said, you know, things are messy and people can be unkind and things happen that are unexpected and confusing. So the fact that books were giving me that information made books incredibly valuable. To me. Um, and I think that really, like, I loved reading, but that really cemented my idea that, oh, like, books are going to get me through stuff. Mm, I, I love that, that it's, uh, you know, books, we talk about them transporting us to another place, um, but a lot of times books can transport us to another way of feeling and another way of, of dealing with, uh, with the world around us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what other kinds of stuff did you read? I liked, oddly enough, because I don't as much anymore, thrillers and horror stuff. So a lot of Stephen King. Um, there was this writer named John Saul. I don't know if you remember. I think so. Yeah. The... Suffer the Children. Yeah. Um, V.C. Andrews, all of her books. And then as I got into middle school, I started reading, this was like the 1980s now, those Epic blockbusters by Judith Kranz, Jackie Collins, Sidney Sheldon. And this, to me, took storytelling and reading to like a whole other level. Um, and that really cemented the idea of, I don't know if I was like, okay, I'm going to be a writer. But I was like, okay, I want to go out and kind of live a big or life than what I'm experiencing now. And um, these characters like showed me there is a different way to live. Right, right. So at what point did you put pen to paper and start coming up with your own stories? I always was. Like, yeah. That's the thing. Like, I think a lot of writers will tell you this. Like, they they just were always writing. Just wait. I think, you know, I had kids in my classes who were, they were always drawing pictures. They were doodling. They were artists. I think writers are always writing. But I never thought that this was a realistic career goal. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be able to be a writer, but I could go work in book publishing. Like that was my next best thing. So after college, I got a job at HarperCollins and I was really happy and excited to be part of like the process of getting books into the world. And um, after working in book publishing for a while, I realized that you know, writers aren't these magical people who just produce these perfect works, right? <laughs> right? Like I saw manuscripts come in late. I saw things get rejected. I realized, oh, this is just people trying and other people helping them. And this is a process. And that really freed me up to eventually try myself. I I love that idea that these these are just imperfect people who have ideas and then other people are helping them to, to realize those uh, those ideas and dreams um, that um, that's a perfect way to look at it because we think of writing as such a solitary thing that it's one person and it's all of this thing. But but really, you know, by the time a book hits the shelves, um, it's uh, it's been informed by a lot of people. Not that not that everyone has ultimate say over it, but the it does become a bit of a collective thing. Absolutely. You know, you can do only so much on your own. And then when you've been working on something so closely, you sort of stop being able to see it. And it really takes outside readers to see the holes or see where characters are underdeveloped um, or see that emotional notes that you think you're hitting aren't coming through. So other readers are invaluable. And every writer I know has that first go-to person who reads it before anyone else. Um, and gives feedback, whether it's their editor, whether it's a friend or a spouse. You know, my husband is also my literary agent, so he's always my first reader. So before my editor even sees it, you know, he's helped me um, close some of those loops. Right. 
Um, I, I'm curious when you when you work in publishing and you kind of see behind the curtain and and see and you and that realization starts to come in that you know that uh, that writers are just regular people and publishers are regular people and editors are regular people and you know all the way down the line. Does that encourage you um, to write more or is it uh, is it kind of daunting to know uh, you know what the machinery is like? interestingly both at the same time i can see that it's it's encouraging because it's there's no fear of having to be perfect or um you know no fear of like oh do i deserve a place at the table but there's also the knowledge that no one can make something happen like there's no magic wand there's no perfect publicist there is still this unknown quality or this intangible quality to what makes a book connect and other books don't connect. And I think it's like that pursuit of that um, mysterious thing that kind of brings all of us together. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, so as a kid who, who loved Judy Bloom and then, uh, you know, migrated over toward uh, horror and psychological type stuff and then went through the, the big, glossy blockbuster 80s um I, I remember all those books um what would you say is your writing style like uh, uh you know you you look back through your influences and, and you look at at what things uh you know had an impact on you and, and what things that you took from those and carried forward and then things of, of your own that you bring in um how would you describe the things that you do I would describe what I do as um, family drama and escapist reading. So I like to tell stories that are about real families and you know grounded people in beautiful settings that are experiencing change and ultimately connection. So every story I really loved was ultimately about a family, whether it was the, you know, the darkness of the family in Flowers in the Attic, ultimately those siblings came together, or those multi-generational stories of Judith Kranz, um, even some of the Stephen King, you know, it's a, they all have family in common. What you realize, you know, publishing is still a business and certain types of books fall in or out of favor. So as much as I love the Judith Kranz books, no one's writing like that anymore. And it's not that probably someone can't, it's just readers don't seem to want that, you know, 800 page tome that starts, you know, in the 1800s. Um, so I was, what I write is something that readers seem to connect to today, contemporary stories. Um, all my books are set in different beach towns because they're published in the summer. And I want people to experience what I want to experience today, which is something that's escapist but emotionally satisfying. So um, when you're and, – and, and that's a that's a great um, summation. And, and I, I think you you really nailed those emotions, those feelings – that uh, that all of us want to connect with, and uh, in, in a in a very tangible way. Um, you're so you're working in publishing. Um, when did you start working up the nerve to uh, to start um, you know working on your own stories and start submitting them? And 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 you know when you're working inside the industry, um, is it easier or, or harder to get your own stuff out there? And um, you know how do you start going through that process? Uh, it's easier. Uh, I was working as a literary agent. And so it was easier in one sense, because I had access to, you know, people who could get my work in front of editors. But at the same time, the quality, you know, of the material has to be there, because publishing, ultimately, it's, you know, it's democratic, publishers won't publish something that they, they don't think readers will connect to. Sure. So I also waited until I was, I think, close to 40 and really felt like I had something I wanted to say. Um, so the timing had also something to do with when I felt ready to, like, put stories out there as much as the technical ability to get an agent and a publisher and that sort of thing. That, um, waiting until you feel like you have something to say, um, is that – 
an important thing um, to you? Is, is gathering life experience an, an important thing for a writer, in your opinion? I think it really is. But look, Zadie Smith had that in her 20s, right? Like some people just have that early. I was completely immature and had, frankly, nothing to offer in my 20s, even if I'd had the best technical craft possible. I really think the more you live, the more you can say about life in your work. And, you know, I, I read a book by on writing by an author named Rita Mae Brown. And she talked about the importance of exploring the, the story through multiple perspectives and being able to see a young person's point of view and an older person, person's point of view, male, female, whatever. And the more you experience that yourself, I think your, your work has to become more multidimensional. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, th there's some people that just have a, a freakish ability to uh, – to connect uh maybe their old souls or, or something like that but yeah but in my 20s i was an idiot and uh, i had nothing uh that deserved to be read by anyone oh, i'm right there with you <laughs> totally <laughs> so, so yeah so when you um when you begin um and what was that first book that uh well first off did you have books that you uh that you had written that didn't get published uh, I had worked on a YA for a while, um, and I'd explored it with an agent maybe when I was in my 30s, and then nothing really happened with it. But the next project I wrote did get published. Was that The Wedding and Sisters? No, it was actually something just before that. It was a novel called The Gin Lovers, and this was an interesting time in publishing because publishers were experimenting with – um, serial ebooks, and their thought was, what if we release books, like portions of a book weekly? So it was like the experience of watching a TV show, where you waited for the next episode. And as someone who always loved um, soap operas and like soapy drama, this seemed like a great idea to me. So we, I wrote it in these six installments. It was released um, as ebook, and then it was compiled into one novel for people to ultimately buy. Um, and it was a historical and it was kind of like trashy and juicy and fun, <laughs> but ultimately I think publishers discovered, no readers actually don't want to consume books that way. So that was an experiment. And then my next novel that's really more in line with what I do annually was the wedding sisters. Gotcha. Yeah. There were, uh, there was a lot of experimentation during that time. I, I know Hugh Howie with his book, wool, uh, published it. Um, it, episodically, and then a big omnibus at the end, and that was a massive uh, success. But not many after that. I, I think that was a kind of a, a, a weird time uh, of experimentation, which I love. But you know, yeah. um, but but still, I I, I want to read a book, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, and you're not alone. Yeah, clearly. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. sounding uh, response seemed to be you're not alone. Tonight. Right, exactly. So tell me about the Wedding Sisters. What was it about this book um, that made the difference, and uh, and uh, kind of what was your path to getting that published? Well, this goes back to the idea of having something to say, and I was getting married for the second time. I had two preteen daughters and I was really starting to like be at that point in life where you're like looking back and looking forward and um I was dealing with the truth that as what people get really excited about weddings and it's supposed to be this really happy time but actually it makes everyone extremely stressed out so I wanted to explore wedding through the lens of what happens when a wedding you know because in fiction, they say the best way to reveal character is to apply pressure. So I'm like, okay, what better way to reveal character than through a wedding? So it's the story of two parents, their three daughters who all get engaged within months of one another. And because of financial constraints, they decide to do one big wedding. <laughs> because and, that's going to work out well. <laughs> right, exactly. So <laughs> through that, I can see I could explore all the notions of, you know, marriage and midlife. Um, money, sibling rivalry, um, grandparents, generational relationships, secrets. Um, and that was my first novel where I was like saying something about what it means to be a family. 
Right. Um, after that book, you uh, you wrote uh, The Forever Summer, The Husband Hour, and your new book is Drawing Home. Um, after that first book, what did you learn about writing and publishing um, that, that has helped you to carry forward? Well, things have you know, changed a lot since I started working on publishing. And the one thing I was very aware of is the value in – maintaining a publication schedule. You know, once a reader likes your book, they want to keep um, having more material. So being on a schedule of publishing a book a year became important. And that really helped me be focused and disciplined. And, um, you know, when you know you're going to do that, there's a way of like keeping an eye out for story. There's a way of, um, I think keeping in touch with your readers, like the whole thing just becomes very cohesive. So after the Wedding Sisters, once I knew the Forever Summer was coming, it just, there was a momentum there. Gotcha. Um, When when you start thinking about a new book, um, what usually comes first for you? Is it a character? Uh, Is it a plot point? Is it a setting? Um, like, Like how do stories usually begin to form for you? Usually with previous books, it was the idea of a story. And then the question becomes, who are the characters who can best tell the story? And then it's where is the best place to to tell this story? With Drawing Home, for the first time, I had a place first. And that place is Sag Harbor, New York, which is the Hamptons. Um, Specifically, I was fascinated by a hotel in the center of town, which is called the American Hotel. And it's a historic building that's been standing since the Revolutionary War. And the hotel itself, you know, the decor has not changed since the 70s, but like in a good way. And the place is just really fascinating because even though it's a hotel for visitors to town, it's also the most vibrant local hangout. And what I experienced there is you could be sitting at the bar And on one side of you is the guy who runs the local water taxi. And on the other side of you is like Billy Joel. And I thought, this is an amazing place to hang out. And I want to bring my readers to hang out here. So then I just had to figure out the story. But so the the place did come first this time. So after that, and and you start, uh, like, were you very familiar with, with Sag Harbor? And, 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 and if not, what do you do or, or for any of your, your books when you're, when you're getting familiar with a location? Um, how do you begin to, to kind of get the feel and the, the flavor of a specific place? Once I decide on the place for a book, I start spending time there. Not necessarily like large, long chunks of time, but repeated visits. And I talk to as many people as possible. I talk to the people who work at the hotel. I talk to the person who runs the water taxi. I go to the historical museum, if there is one. Um, People, I find, are the best source of of, uh, information. And, for example, Provincetown, you know, there's people who have lived there for generations. Sag Harbor, I met a man by chance in the historical society whose parents, great, great grandparents have been the original owner of the hotel. So I just look for personal stories that can, I can kind of weave into my fictional one. Gotcha. Um, at what point in the kind of pre-writing and the, uh, you know, the, the story shaping that goes in b- before the book starts, um, when did uh, Emma Mapson come to you and, and, and how did, does she factor into the story? So Emma Mapson, who's the um, the heroine of the story, since I wanted to center the story around the hotel, which is what was the creative spark to begin with, I wanted someone who was working at the hotel, someone who had, you know, like deep knowledge of the place, had affection for the place, and who would bring the readers there consistently uh, throughout the book, you know, for, for a purpose. She wasn't, but the odd thing was she was a, one of the later characters to develop because I was first focused on the antagonist in this book. So the story is about a woman, Emma, who works behind the front desk at the hotel. She works long hours. She has a teenage daughter. She struggles to make ends meet. And at the beginning of the summer, 
her daughter mysteriously inherits like the most grand house on the water in town. So while she's trying to figure out why and how this happened, a woman from Manhattan sweeps into town to try to wrest the estate away from her. And the antagonist, that woman, B, I had the idea for her first. Um, and I find, as a novelist, one of the challenges is the, the, the villains or the antagonists are always the most fun to write. Of course. Uh, right. So, like, that's, they're so creatively freeing. But your reader always needs a, a realistic sort of portal that they can experience a story through. So oddly, sometimes that character is the harder one to write. In that case, that was Emma. You know, making someone in, like an every woman is sometimes harder than writing the character who's sort of flamboyant and a little crazy and provocative. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's uh, – sometimes it's harder to nail down the the motives of the protagonist when, and, and the when the antagonist uh, can can be so – kind of over the top um yes yeah yeah I, I i get that um when since it sounds like this book the the creative process was different on a lot of levels from your previous books this one you began with a setting uh first and and not a particular character and you were more focused on on the antagonist to begin with how do you feel like those two things um shaped the writing of this book and did it give you kind of fresh insight that that uh, maybe shook things up from the way you normally do things? You know, honestly, it didn't, it wasn't that it gave me fresh insight. It just took me a little longer <laughs> because um, with every book, there's um, varying degrees of false starts. And this one just took me a few tries to kind of get it right in terms of how I was going to tell the story. And like you said, it's easier to have motivation for someone who's trying to do something selfish versus your, your heroine, because the, the primary question is, what does your character want and what's getting in their way? And sometimes with, quote, normal people, it's hard to make a concrete want that's beyond, well, she wants to be happy. You know, she wants her kid to be happy. Like, what is what can you show on the page? And so sometimes that starting with that primary want is hard to um, to get to get right. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And and I I've actually had that same experience with a book that I've been working on lately. Um, that you know you get like a third of the way through the book, and and you're you're just like you know I I don't think this character's motivation is is true. Um, and you kind of go back and you kind of keep farming that character looking for what he or yes. she is really about. And the, But when you find it, uh, it makes all the difference. And you're like, okay, yes. now, now I understand. And, uh, you know, um, that, that's um, – people that can do strict, strict outlines and have the whole book completely sketched out before they begin and never deviate for that just amaze me. Um, because sometimes I have to kind of work with the character some until I figure out who they are. And then that dictates, you know, where the story goes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what is your process like? Do you, are you, um, an outliner? Do, do you know the beginning from the end, uh, or the end from the beginning? Um, and, or, or are you, uh, a discovery writer that that's kind of working through the story as she goes? No, I definitely have structure in place. You know, I know the beginning, the middle, the crisis, the end, you know, the basic three act structure I have in, I have down. And then, um, I outline probably five chapters at a time. So it's like, I always say like an analogy and someone else, there was a writer who actually said this, I forget who, maybe Robert Frost. Like you can see if I can see as far ahead in the story as if you're driving on a dark road and you've got your headlights on like just enough to keep going and not crash. So I keep outlining as I go, always about five chapters ahead of where I am. Gotcha. Um, when uh, does does your does your big structure change as you're writing ever? No, no, because um, the structure 
stays the same. Like I know where I'm going. It's just the choices along the way to get there. Um, it's, it's like there's certain, sometimes you make a wrong turn, so to speak, but the structure is pretty much locked. Um, and I know what main points I want to hit. It's the problem or the challenge is always just getting there in an interesting way, in a feasible way, not writing yourself into a corner. Um, but I, the structure itself, the framework doesn't change. Right, right. I, I almost always know how the book is going to end and and usually a big climax scene and, and a, an emotional payoff. Um, and, and I like to think of it like I'm, I'm going to drive across the country from New York to California. Um, and, and I know several of the big stop offs along the way. But whether we go, you know, through uh, through St. Louis or mm -hmm. whether we go through Memphis, um, you know, is, is up for for you know uh, up for the characters to decide and a lot of times yes. that opens up a lot of great possibilities along the way exactly yeah um the the new book is is out available everywhere now um what what can people expect from this book from drawing home we uh, we we've talked a little bit about uh, who the characters are and, and some of their motivation what um what else happens along the way that you can tease uh, readers with a little bit so drawing home first of all it takes you into an amazing historic you know summer town sag harbor there's a great history there and i i strategically made some of the characters you know well versed in history so readers can experience some of that it's a story about um sort of the people we meet in life that unexpectedly i guess uh, can help solve our problems or complete our lives in ways we didn't know needed to be completed. Um, and it's ultimately, I think, I'd say a mother-daughter story. And it's about being a parent and it's about a little bit of, of letting go. So I think those are the some of the themes I hit in the book. Gotcha. Um, this is, uh, a, a lot of people refer to your books as, as beach reads. Um, what, what does that mean to you? A beach read means to me a book that you read when you want to just enjoy yourself and escape and not work too hard. Um, it's funny because this has been coming up a lot lately and, uh, I think maybe the question is, oh, is this a pejorative term? But I think beach anything with the word beach in it to me it just means better you know like beach with anything is better so to me it's just it's escapist fun reading I mean there are I do deal with some um you know serious themes in the book um but ultimately the tone and the experience and the setting is one of escapism and enjoyment Gotcha. Well, this is, uh, is definitely um, a book that, that you can get lost in, and the story ramps up almost immediately, and you, you find yourself just uh, sucked in. And I, I love what you're doing. I, I love the way you do it. Um, the, the book Drawing Home is available everywhere now in hardcover, Kindle edition, audio book. Uh, Jamie, if people are just learning about you and, and want to dig into your back catalog and find out more about you and follow along for news coming up, is there a place uh, that that people can find you online to connect with you? Absolutely. My website is jamiebrenner.com, and readers can sign up for my newsletter online. And also, I'm on Instagram all the time, and I'm really finding that to be the best way I have been connecting to to readers and that's jamie brenner author on instagram excellent i'm going to put links to everything to the new book drawing home and your website and and social media in the show notes of this episode uh, jamie thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today hank thank you great conversation Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Mather steepled his hands. You asked to join us once? Hedwick leaned forward eagerly. 
the appointed. Does that appeal? Yes. Do you even know what we do? My grandmother used to say that you control the world. That's not far off. But why? To what end? I don't know. Power? Pour me a bourbon. Mather reached into his briefcase and produced a file folder. I want to tell you one story. Have you ever heard of Centralia, Pennsylvania? No. He produced a photo for Hedwig's inspection. Spring of 1962. A pretty little town, wasn't it? Whitewash and ticky-tacky, pastel housewives and perfect lawns. A mining community, mostly. Coal. He turned over a second photo. A lovely young woman. There was a single witch in Centralia named Anna Lively. Anna had a green thumb. She could make her garden grow, whisper to a flower, and send it shooting from the ground like that. Just lovely. But she was discovered. That spring, a boy named Bobby Avery received a Bell and Howell Zoomatic movie camera for his 11th birthday. Bobby amused himself by filming his neighbors, sometimes without their knowledge, through windows and over garden fences. Twelve seconds of film, just a girl and her garden patch and one swiftly blooming rose. It killed the town. Bobby showed it to his friends. Children believe readily. Bobby was the first to die. Parents looked into it, watched the film themselves, and they began to die. Anna disappeared. Perhaps they attacked her. Perhaps she escaped. But even in her absence, knowledge of a true witch was running wild through the population, as if Anna had beckoned it herself to grow verdant and spread. The Great Curse had killed 64 Centralians by the 1st of June. The footage was offered to a national news organization. That was the precipice. It might have been shown in prime time, between Leave It to Beaver and My Three Sons. We came very close to another worldwide calamity, but we were fortunate. One of our own was in place at the network. He alerted his superiors, and they ended the situation. Do you know how? I'm afraid to ask. Mather laid down another photo. This is Centralia today. It was an aerial view of a forest. Endless trees and underbrush cut through by lanes of pavement. Just a maze of cracking asphalt, like the foundations of Sodom, ripped bare by the wrath of God. Only a cemetery remained, on a hill overlooking the former town. A white marble angel stood among the graves, grieving for the ruins below, like Lot's wife, turned to salt. You destroyed the whole town? Not I. This was well before my time. But, yes. Just as you'd cauterize a wound to stop a patient from bleeding to death. We blamed it on an uncontrollable mine fire, deep below the earth. We actually set the coal burning, in case someone investigated. It burns today. Touch any of those streets and you'll find them hot the asphalt melting as if the town sat just above perdition. It's not something we're proud of, but it was necessary to save the world. Centralia, Pennsylvania, and everyone who'd seen that film had to be sacrificed. Mather collected the photos. So, that is why the appointed exist, and that is what we do. Still want to join? 